Good afternoon, this is Gary Kavner here on TRSI. I am here today with my friend and colleague, Michael Dwyer. We weren't here last week as Michael was ill, and while I might have been tempted to do something on my own, or Michael might have attempted to prompt me to do something on my own, uh, I thought, given the general circumstances and that John had already published a long podcast apologising for those circumstances, I just thought, you know, let the attention rest where it should. On anyone who isn't me. <laughs> That's a sound policy. I approve. So for those of you who haven't quite got enough gripped in your life, I do have to make somewhat of an announcement. We will very shortly have a store. By the time you hear this, it may already be on the site or it may turn up uh, during the week. Or To be honest, it'll happen shortly. I'm just not sure of the exact date. One of the things, obviously there'll be mugs and that sort of things. But one of the things we'll be selling, but we have a very limited quantity, is the gripped 2024 calendar, wall calendar and desk calendar. Why you might be interested in this is I have individually gone through all of the photos of, or sorry, the videos of interviews that we have done with ministers this year and taken the most exquisite examples of gripped face that I could find and put them all into a picture calendar. So it'll be a delight for young and old alike. We're also going to send it to all of the politicians featured and ask them to take a photo with it just to show Michael, because obviously it's being done in the name of good, clean fun. Yeah. Rather than mockery. No, no. Good, clean fun. Yeah. yeah. So they are going to go on, I think, pre-order uh, shortly. Uh, presumably they'll all be delivered before Christmas or you know before the new year anyway. But they are very limited in quantity. If you're a gold or silver sub, I think you'll probably get one for free. If you're a bronze sub, we'll probably uh, give you a, a discount on it. In an ideal world, we would just give all subscribers a free one. But unfortunately, these things are actually relatively expensive to print. And, you know, that's capitalism for you. Or is that capitalism or is that just... Naked greed. Naked greed, yes. It's, it's my naked greed as well. Yeah. yeah, both of those things can be true at once. We missed a, a number of things which are actually quite interesting and which we will go into. Um, there was the uh, rural independence debate on immigration. Uh, tied to that was there was a new poll that came out from Ireland Thinks, which was looking at just general party support, but also looking at um, you know, what people on the ground are concerned in and also their views on uh, anti-immigration uh, parties. Although I found the presentation of the poll in relation to the questions about support for anti-immigration parties is not exactly what the poll asked. Would you rather start on the poll or the doll debate, Michael? Oh, we'll start on the poll because polls are fun. All right. So we'll go into the, the party movements that we've seen in this. I suppose the most interesting question there was the poll asked, uh, would you consider voting for a party or candidate who holds strong anti-immigration views. Now, when this is being reported, it's generally being reported as, you know, the result X says they would vote for an anti-immigration party. That's not what they were asked. It was strong anti-immigration views. Like this That's is, an important word. That's, yeah. The use this, of the word strong is, is, is important there. Yeah. So could you vote for a hardline anti-immigration party? Is not the same as a, you know, and, and he, now they did this two years ago in September 2021 and they found that 14% said they would vote for such a party and 76% said they wouldn't with 10% saying they don't know. They haven't run it since then. So this is the first in over two years, but the results now are 28% say yes, 63% say no, and there's still 9% who don't know what they are, you know, where they stand on it. So I think the reporting of this has been quite interesting and the discussion around it, because the discussion around it has generally been, isn't it a good thing that this number is so low on one hand <laughs> and removing the strong part of the question. So it sounds like this is the amount of people who would vote for an anti or party with anti-immigration policies in totality. You've got yes. to imagine that number is higher if you remove the strong, but on the whole, you know, isn't it great that only so many people can hold such a view? In the last poll that Ireland um, thinks did, this this poll, where they looked at the, the support for the parties, Sinn Féin have gone down 3%. I think that's 7% over their last two polls. Yeah. But Sinn Féin are also at 28%. 
And Sinn Féin are the largest party in the country by popular share um, on that level. And 28%, Michael, is exactly the amount of people who said they would consider voting for a party or candidate who holds strong anti-immigration views. So on the whole, that's not a lot of people. In Irish political terms, that's quite a lot of people. That is a very lot of people. And, and just on the strong thing, I just wanted to throw this be you're you're the poll man, but my sense historically, when you when you read how questions are phrased in polls, particularly on sensitive cultural issues like this, and issues where there has been quite a distinct, consistent narrative and tone coming from most of the media and from the the political parties, the insertion of a word, an adjective like strong. Whether it's a deliberate, whether it's it's done deliberately by the the polling company to produce a result, or whether it's just generally, listen, this is actually what we want to find out. So this is a, a question, shall we say, without an agenda. Generally speaking, use that work will tend to. So you would expect it to suppress the level of of positive responses in your answer. Because certainly, if you're in a culture where, shall we say the perception that being anti-immigrant may also be be connected to an extreme form of politics or a form of racism or any of the other things which we regard as being bad. Obviously, when you put that strong word, you go, "Mm, well, that's not who I, that's not how I imagine myself. That's not how I think of myself. So while I might support some sensible balanced policies on immigration i think maybe we've got immigration wrong Mm, strong strong puts me off and the fact that it's doubled from 14 percent to 28 percent it also tells you gary just uh, en en passant what a tremendous success the government policies have been in the last two years around this subject i think on the, the the strong part of it if you are polling for something like this there is a difficulty in figuring out, well, how do I word that? How do I put that together? Because someone will come to you and say, I I want to know, would people support an anti-immigration party? And you're like, okay, but what does that mean? Like, how do you ask people that? Because it, I remember there was a poll we were discussing a while ago, Michael, and one of the questions was, it had phrased it as, um, basically, do you support these policies that go too far? No one is going to say yes, because no one thinks their policies go too far. That's why you support them. You think they go the right... Yeah, there was another question which said, do you think that it was something like sufficient uh, sufficient measures should be taken? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I... I think it was on the it was on hate speech and one of the NGOs had, had put it out. And it, yes, it was it was asking about sufficient steps should be taken. And a massive amount of people said yes, because... Everyone believes sufficient steps should be taken. It's just, what does that actually mean? And I think there were they may have put in strong just as a basic differentiator because different people consider different policies and different parties and different views anti-immigration. It's kind of awkward to poll for unless you have a clear party or clear policy you can target. And Ireland doesn't really have that for the most part. But yeah, the fact it is doubled doesn't indicate the government is, is handling this very well. No. We will always go back when we look at any kind of polling like this to the question which you quite correctly always put the caveat with, which is, okay, say if we did a poll on, and we we said this a number of times, I'm sure, this specific instance I have. Anyway, if you poll people on the health service Mm -hmm. and you ask them a kind of a generalised macro question about the health service, people very often will say that the health service is a disaster. The health service is in a dire state. The health service needs more money. It needs better management. The health service needs massive reform. It's an awful state, you know. If you then ask them a micro question, which is, what has your personal experience of the health service been? The, t- the positive numbers tend to be very, very high. Mm-hmm. But even going away from that, and even looking at leaving the micro question alone, we're looking just at the macro question. It, it, and you see a consistent trend over a number of years of negative polling regarding the health service the question then still remains are people going to vote on the health service is that going to be the thing that's going to be in their minds when they go in to put their pencil 
and mark their number ones and their number twos on the ballot sheet. And traditionally the answer to that has been no. That there will be lots of subjects, lots of areas where you will, you will get small numbers of people who will regard this as being the number one issue. So, for example, we've talked before about housing. I tend to be more bearish on housing as a voting issue. I think housing will be a stronger, but you have tend to say, well, yeah, that's fine. But there are lots of people who are not affected by housing. And ultimately, people will vote on the economy stupid. So the question here is, to what extent is this becoming the kind of subject that, where people will actually say this has become almost if not quite a single issue vote for me but this is now something that is actually going to be the single most important factor in me deciding on how i'm going to vote now just before you respond to me i just i, I, I throw in a, a brackets there a concession shall we say the degree to which it might be an issue on which we vote may also be the degree to which they see it as affecting the economy, or shall we say, their own personal economy. When we say the economy, what we really mean is, am I doing well now? Do I feel like I'm doing fairly well? And do I think that in the future going forward, I'm going to continue doing well? The Americans would call that question, the question in the United States would be, is the country going in the right direction? So that, am I going to keep going, doing well? Am I doing well now? So to the effect that that starts to impinge on their sense of their well-being and their well, future well-being, is uh, will will affect that question in the same way as i think that housing actually is going to become a much bigger issue simply because i think a hell of a lot of the economy is downstream of housing and i think that even if you're if you have a house and you don't have a mortgage and you're not looking to rent there are, there are all sorts of other issues around you your family and your job etc whatever that will be affected by housing so that it it, it 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 will drag the economy into it. But anyway, what do you think? Do you think that this is an issue that's moving towards being something that people will actually vote on? Or, or is it something that people will just say they're annoyed about, but when it comes to the vote, they will look to their pocketbook? I think I'm not a great believer in the idea voters individually can be quite rational. Voters as a mass, I don't generally think of as being terribly rational. I think you get... People have a general kind of vibe that drives them to vote. The general feeling about how they are doing, how the country is doing, how all of that is doing. Hmm. So in relation to housing, yes, I'm, I, I, I tend to underplay the polls that say the people will vote on it. And I recognize I am going against quite a lot of polls on that. I think it plays into the vibe, but I don't think it is the primary driver of it. Mm -hmm. Immigration, I think, is an interesting one in that the majority of people are not going to be impacted by it or at least in the way that we've seen you know small villages in which large amounts of people have been moved in by the government are impacted by it where i think it is a danger to some of the political parties is that it can create a it can feed in to a general feeling of frustration and incompetence and it all kind of becomes one thing it is I think also perhaps particularly dangerous for Sinn Féin. In a way, it's not for the other parties. The commentary on why Sinn Féin uh, seem to have been losing votes, a lot of that seems to basically be looking at this as Sinn Féin have made some political mishaps in relation to drawing attention to their um, their own history with law and order. Yeah. And, you know, calling for the no confidence men, uh, motion in Helen McEntee was a grievous error because it made people look at their, their record. I don't think that's right at all. I think Sinn Féin's record is well known. Well, it's, it's understood. And I think it's just priced into the equation. I absolutely agree. I think it's priced in. And as regards this, there was a lot of talk amongst people like you and me and politicians about to the degree to which it was, this was just a, a, a tactical or even strategic error by putting down this motion of confidence in the justice minister which would make people think about the one day could be a, a Sinn Féin justice minister I think that's very much inside baseball I, I don't think that that's how most people outside were thinking I don't think they were paying that much attention to it I think the, I, that this is going to suddenly produce this laser focus on their history but most of all as you say I think it's priced in Everybody 
pretty well knows the story and they've made a decision. Those people who have made a decision to, dry, to draw a line under it have made that decision. There are certain people for whom it will be impossible to do that and they will never vote for Sinn Féin and find the idea of a Sinn Féin government just morally reprehensible indeed. But I think for a lot of voters, they've just said, uh, we, we know where they are and, you know, that was then, this is now, in the words of Bertie. And we're, 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 we're moving on. Where, what I think is, and the reason I think immigration is particularly dangerous to Sinn Féin, is that Sinn Féin, we know from the research on this, has the larger, and I, I keep repeating this like a mantra, I think, or maybe just in conversations I've been having recently. The research shows that Sinn Féin voters and Sinn Féin as a party have the largest variance between why people say they vote for Sinn Féin and what Sinn Féin says its actual policies are at the national level of any party in Ireland, and it's not even close. It is a massive variance. And they've been able to manage it quite well, largely because in working class areas, Sinn Féin councillors on the ground are much more conservative than the national party. And to a certain extent, the party allows them to put forward a a vision of Sinn Féin that is simply not accurate is not Mm. what Sinn Féin now is. And where I think the danger for Sinn Féin is, and why I think that this Sinn Féin's losses may be related to immigration, but not directly, is that once people, those people notice that Sinn Féin's immigration policies are not what they've been led to believe they are, they might start looking at Sinn Féin more generally. And there might be a realisation that actually this party is not what is being presented to us by our councillors or at local level. And that, I think, is, is the danger for Sinn Féin of this. They don't want a situation where their voters, particularly working class, more nationalist voters, start questioning what Sinn Féin's policies actually are at the national level and whether or not that's what they actually agree with. I think that's right. I, we talked before, we mentioned before, the, 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 the piece of analysis that was done by Cormac Lucy where he, 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 he had a graph basically describing the state of Irish politics and on one on the, the top half of the, of the graph, you have the line describing those parties which you, you might describe as the status quo parties, so Fine Fáil, Fine Gael and Labour, and then the other, the parties, I suppose at different times, uh, Sinn Féin, the Workers' Party, the, the, the Democratic Left, whatever, possibly the PDs would have been included there as well at some stage. I, parties which he described as change parties. And what he, his argument was that we are actually closer to a Sinn Féin majority than people think because for the first time in the history of this graph, the number of people who are vote, change voters is higher than the number of people who are status quo voters. And we adverted to the fact that that was an interesting and compelling argument in, on the face of it. However, it was, it was, it was working on the assumption that there would be only one change party. And that would be Sinn Féin. If in, if there are other change parties out there, then that, precisely for the reasons they put that, that values gap that exists that you talked about. A, a change party which is out there, which is closer to those values and those emotional tags that th- those voters that are, f- f- shall we say, away from the, 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 the official party line, the party orthodoxy, that becomes a problem for them. I, I, I've said to you before, I'm sure I've said it on the podcast before, uh, a couple of times in, I was involved with a, a candidate who did some in focus grouping. Now we're talking at this stage 15 years ago. But one of the things that was very interesting, that was unexpected because he, he had said to them, listen, ask some stuff ask some questions that are outside the norm. We want to try and see if there's something that we haven't really uncovered or something that might surprise us. One thing that did surprise was the level to which young, and he, at the time we were talking, I think 18 to 30, maybe 18 to 29, young urban voters, especially men, but not all, not it wasn't massively differentiated, were very attached to the nation and to the, to the to the traditions the notional traditions of the nation now they were in many ways not social conservatives gary their their attitudes to say to sex to sexuality to their attitudes to gay people their attitudes to marriage their attitudes to the consumption perhaps of illicit Illegal substances, all that kind of stuff, very, very different to their parents or their grandparents. They were, they're, 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 
fairly typical urban Western European kinds of people. But they did see themselves, and they had a very strong sense of themselves of Irish, their sense of pride in their Irishness and in their sense of tradition. Now, those voters, I suspect, once upon a time, in fact, we, we know from it, we have a fair, de decent idea, that they were the kind of Bertie Ahern voter, right? And I think we can agree that a lot of those voters after the collapse in 2009 migrate, have, been, have migrated or are migrating to, fin to Sinn Féin. But they're not really culturally completely at home with what is the, 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 the party orthodoxy. And this may be one of those issues that starts to, to, to maybe to crystallize in their minds a sense of, well, this isn't quite what I thought you were. Maybe this isn't quite the marriage that we thought we were getting into. And if that did happen, if that kind of reflection started to happen, and then somebody turned up, either say something like, say, independent Ireland, or actual independence happening in these areas, that could create a real problem for Sinn Féin. Yeah, I think Sinn Féin, there's two ways I think this can fail for Sinn Féin. One is, as you said, the rise of alternative groupings, which are more authentically in those spaces. Um, I mean, Sinn Féin on the ground does have quite a lot of... You're right, they're not, they're not conservative in the way it would normally be seen. Maybe small C conservative. They're, they have particular interests in national identity, things like that. But you're right, not on often not on abortion, not on gay marriage, not on those kind of things. But a general conservatism about the state and the nation. Uh, and a pride, I think, as well, oftentimes. Also, they place a high value on work. And I, we, we have certainly talked before, but one of the things that both of us, I think, were really interested and surprised by was that the, 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 the exit polling where when that question, the famous, well, anybody who's listening to this podcast would say famous question, it would, if in the situation where the state had a surplus uh, to, uh, of, of revenue to distribute, would you prefer it was spent A, on improving public services or B, on tax cuts? <clears throat> this Sinn Féin voters were the most likely to say they would favour tax cuts. Yeah, I, I, I found it surprising that Sinn Féin voters as a whole would say that, but not surprising that working class people would say that. I mean, growing up in a working class area, you tend to find very positive views of things like entrepreneurship and a very strong support for very harsh criminal penalties because people tend to forget that while the if you were to look at the... the a class breakdown of people in Irish prisons. A lot of them would be on you know, lower class uh, and lower middle class. But those people and, and those communities are also the primary victims of crime because those people are in their communities. So it's not really surprising that they, they, they don't want that. And frankly, if they had their way, we'd probably still be holding public executions or at least public floggings. But on the question of, of, of where I think Sinn Féin can fail... Obviously, yes, if a new vehicle comes in, that can convince people. I think the danger there, or the difficulty there, is that Sinn Féin is so effective organisationally that it would be very difficult to fight against them without Sinn Féin itself making glaring errors, which I think is the second danger. I remember after the last election, Michael, we had a couple of conversations where I was bringing up that the NGOs had started to take an interest in Sinn Féin. And a lot of the, should we say, the background organizations of the Irish state had started to take an interest in them and were trying to build links with them. Because while they didn't like them historically, they were now looking like they could, you know, a realistic option for government. So you have to get in there. And we were making or making the point that these entities aim, they have their own, their own policy interests which don't match with a lot of Sinn Féin voters, and they were obviously going to try and influence the party. Now, I don't know if they have influenced the party or what we've seen as being sort of an, or an organic movement from the hierarchy of Sinn Féin, but Sinn Féin have definitely moved even further from their more traditional core voters than they were in the election. I think that's, that's absolutely clear. And you could see their handling of the immigration issue was terrible. 
They didn't seem to know what they were doing. Well, yes, and yet we have heard individual TDs coming out and saying, listen, we have a problem with inward immigration. We have a pro- we have a problem with how we're managing it. We need to have to sit down and have a conversation about it. Making the kinds of noises that you wouldn't have expected even a couple of months ago from somebody who was uh, 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 sitting in the Dáil for Sinn Féin. I've said before, and I keep saying that I think that Sinn Féin have within them an, or- an organic capacity to change direction, which is superior to the other two parties at the moment. Now, some of it will be reflective and, and will, be rash- will be a rational choice they may make, and they may try to to fudge the issue and they may run a kind of a parallel campaign one at national level one at the local level you know speaking out of the side of their mouth which is always a dangerous thing to do because you know you can get caught at that or they may simply just they may just simply start to move but that was Finna Falls great strength its ability to know where the people were and get there slightly before the people the interesting the interesting thing to see with Sinn Féin is if such a movement is deemed necessary, a lot of the Sinn Féin's, Sinn Féin's most prominent TDs are on the more intellectual, progressive side of things now. The current leadership is in that space. So Fianna Fáil was able to do that, but it's actually very difficult to do that. To move like that because you need people involved at a very high level who have a degree of, um, should we say, Michael, flexibility to certain things. And the progressive side have never been terribly good at that. So I do wonder if Sinn Féin, if they were to try and move, would actually have a problem within their own leadership with it. And they just wouldn't be able to move quite as quickly. And, and they may have another problem. You and I have been hearing a lot of scuttlebutt. And maybe that's all it is. Maybe all it is. But it's scuttlebutt that's like starting to break out into the main about the fact that there may be quite a number of Sinn Féin TDs who are going to stand down and there may be quite a number of Sinn Féin, of people moving into Sinn Féin into, into, into potentially winnable seats from, say, from a media background or from academia that they're they're looking to to beef up their front bench quite considerably. Now the problem for them there is while you might on the face of it say that well that's a good idea, they need people with recognition, people who are good media performers, people from academia who have a strong intellectual content to them. But the but if they do that, then Gary, that goes back to the problem that you've just adverted to, which is these people will not be flexible or will find it very difficult to be flexible on an issue like this, because they're going to come to it with a much stronger, more worked out ideological position. So if there was to be a shift in the within the parliamentary party in that direction, that would create even more of a problem. That's damaging in and of itself. But if there's also something that is growing to be seen as a viable alternative to you, and it moves quicker than you because it either wants to be in those areas or has a certain ideological openness to a big tent approach rather than a a more dogmatic approach then you're constantly following them and it actually looks quite bad for you because you it becomes obvious that you're being dragged into positions that you don't want to be in rather than this is simply what we believe and you know we've believed it always before we leave this because i know you want to talk about the debate that that was had just Two two things which are, I don't think, unconnected. There was um, uh, there was a, a report which came from the the fiscal, you know, the the body which, the fiscal authority which checks out the numbers the government is is, do in the budget and they got a firm rap on the knuckle saying that they were being, oh, uh, disingenuous and not being sensible and prudent and good and all that. I've got to admire the uh, the fiscal advisory council, Michael. I think they. They're an organisation that deserves our admiration and respect. <laughs> well, they keep going, don't they? Well, that's it. Like, you would think if you dedicated your life to an entirely pointless thing, which no one cared about, eventually you'd just stop. But the Fiscal Advisory Council continues year after year, despite the incredibly apparent truth that the government doesn't give a shit what they say. But yet it just keeps going. And I... I've got to admire that sort of mindless dedication because the alternative is just running into the void. Yeah. However, there is a political point here. 
there was a lot of discussion last year around uh, or not, in the last budget rather about you know whether this is election budget and i was i was very poo-pooing of that notion that it was election budget because why would it be not going to be an election on the very last moment well here's something and i know gary quite correctly doesn't like us talking about gossipy prefers that we talk about news. But I talked to three different people, two Fine Gellers and a Fine Fowler recently, who said to me they are convinced now that uh, they are, that the, 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 the general election is going to happen after the next budget. It's got, basically, they're going to have a, a blowout budget and then bang, they're going to go straight for it. And I said, no, no, they're going to hang on as long. But then they made a very sensible point. The the longest they can go, Gary, I think, is mid March, right? Now, there is an ancient wisdom, ancient in the last thirty or forty years, anyway, that you don't have general elections. You don't have elections of any kind if you can in the period around March, around February, because that's when people's Christmas credit card bills come, and the bills come due after Christmas, right? Mm -hmm. And people tend to be feeling rather miserable anyway and whatever. So, and you you can say, okay, we won't have it in February, we'll, we'll, we'll go. But then if you tie yourself into going at the very last minute, you are just leaving yourself a complete hostage to fortune. You have no room to maneuver. And then you are forced to call an election and something horrible has happened and you have no way out of it and just shit, we're here now. So, actually... When are we talking? When remind me? The budget is when around when October time. Mm -hmm. So it may may it might make more sense, even though people say again historically traditionally prefer not to have uh, winter elections. Listen, they're not going to have one. Well, it, <laughs> I shouldn't say anything like that. But the idea that they might say, "Oh, to hell with it," let's. We're having a European election, we're having a local election, we're having a couple of referendums. Let's have a, a general election along with it. I'm, I'm, I'm not buying that. And if you're having an election in June, I'm finding it hard to imagine you're going to go and have another one either in July or August. So there may actually be a good argument to suggest that a post-budget election may be in the offing. And that, in fact, the last budget was a prep budget for an election. And that the next one will indeed be a lash the money out and hope for the best job. So I've thrown it out there. Chances are that I'll be completely wrong, but you know, just in case I'm right, I'm going to I'm putting my five quid in there now to say that let, keep an eye out for an election next year in the sort of hopefully late autumn, early winter, because that that might just be particularly particularly if uh, Sinn Fein trend where they're trending. I mean, even if they stabilise in the mid-twenties. They're not forming a government, Gary. I'm sure someone said something, Michael, about democracy ending when it, you know, when people realise that they can vote to give themselves money from the Treasury. I feel like that was an important point people made about democracy early on in its existence. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, on to the, um, the debate. The Rural Independents had a debate on immigration. It kind of ties into the Sinn Féin point because what you really don't want if you're Sinn Féin and you're trying to kind of ride this wave without going too far one way or the other is a national debate where everything you say is going to be both broadcast and recorded. That just doesn't help. It was also a wonderful reminder that Holly Cairns is the leader of the Social Democrats. Something I had um, entirely forgotten about. You know, it, it it might be a bad idea for her to learn off her speeches by heart. At times, she fe it feels like she's glued to that piece of paper in front of her. You know? That's purely a style point. It's not a content point. But I do think that somebody said, Holly, you know, you're not supposed to read. Uh, it's not a rule which is enforced terribly often in Don Aaron, but you're not supposed to read it. So the debate was, it was what? It was Wednesday of this week. Carol Nolan opened it off. What the rural independents had put through was basically just a uh, motion that would have no legislative power, really, of its own, but called on the government to act in a particular way, basically to tighten controls on immigration, to uh, look at the definition of a safe country of origin. 
and to basically work to just return people more quickly if they come from those areas, you know, Albania, Georgia, uh, those kind of areas. And it became quite a vicious debate. It was personalized in a way these debates usually aren't. It The only other time you kind of see this sort of thing in Irish uh, government uh, talks is when Sharon Keoghan is talking. <laughs> Because her peers can get um, pretty nasty towards her, actually, in, in quite an unprofessional fashion. Well, it's it's a, a, that or a presidential election, because since there is no policy, it has to be all personality and and can become very personal and very nasty indeed. But yeah, this got very... Uh, you kind of felt, and of course this is maybe me standing on the sideline with my own personal biases working... That it was, there was so much ad hominem going on because there was very little ad re argument to be made. There, there, there was tremendous little, con- it was lots of high flown rhetoric and lots of yes we can and lots of lovely language and then some really kind of retorpative insulting. You thought, well, if you were, I, I don't know, but it just felt like if you're that confident of your position intellectually, then you wouldn't really have to resort to this. You just take you take the opposition in front of you apart with your wonderful forensic analysis of the, the failings and the flaws of their logic and then sit down. But it wasn't like that. Well, you do have a bit of a problem on this issue when someone puts a motion. Part of the motion was uh, they wanted people to say that they recognised that the government's suppression of national debate or dialogue on immigration policy had exacerbated community fear and undermined social cohesion in and of itself. Mm-hmm. That seemed to piss them off. Right. That that would be that that idea would be discussed. I mean, the Social Democrats came out very strongly and very personally about it. I mean, Holly Cairns um, said they were pandering to the far right, stoking up division, spreading fear, that they were putting a target on the back of migrants for the sake of a few votes. They should be ashamed of themselves. And it just kind of kept going. And then you had Aidan O'Reardon, which was um, which was good. So he said that uh, we had an obligation to never stoop to the depths of the rural independent uh, group and say to the outsider, you're not welcome. We must be fearful of you and vote for me. To which Michael Collins, by the way, cut in by saying the Labour Party took women's pensions away from them. <laughs> Probably not what Aidan O'Reardon wanted to um, want to say. There was a, a lot of invective against them. The line I liked the most, Michael, was Aidan O'Reardon saying this. There are things that are more important than getting votes. Now, I wonder, Mike, you know, Michael, just if in his heart, Aidan O'Reardon believes that. I have no window to see into men's hearts, Gary, so I will pass. Do you not have a feeling that Aidan O'Reardon would beat an orphan to death in the street if he thought it would get him 100 votes? If there were no people hanging around with cameras, no. I, I, yeah, why not? Yeah. And then he linked them to the riot in O'Connell Street and said that the rural independents, when they saw uh, Gar the vehicles being set on fire, that they must have been uh, delighted Oh, yeah, because that would be them. That would be the rural independents. They like nothing better than the destruction of private property and the guards being bet up. That's That would very much be their line. What was it he said? He said there is nothing... This was the, the key line. There is nothing more despicable, more cowardly, and more debased in Irish politics than the actions of the members of the rural, rural independent group in relation to the immigration question. And then he said... If they're saying this on the floor of the House, you can only imagine what they're saying in public meetings or at doorsteps in their own constituencies, because even though their voting record in here is anti-woman, anti-LGBT, anti-road safety and anti-worker, and they kind of went on a bit of a, a rant for a while. I'm not sure if it's great politics either. I mean, maybe, it's, maybe it doesn't matter for the Labour voter, because the Labour voter is an increasingly rare species and avis rara. And maybe he's speaking to the Social Democrat voter that has gone away and he wants to get them back and he's not going to... But 
when there are what was the what was the percentage vote gary i can't remember 75 percent of irish voters felt that uh, we had too much immigration you know if that's the position of, if that's the belief of 75 percent then there is a real risk that there's going to be a large chunk of people out there listening to him say this and think does he mean me as well he said that you could reduce to the the motion that the rural independence have put forward to two phrases be afraid of the outsider and vote for me he said it was the lowest common denominator politics from a lowest common denominator political grouping and that he was used to hearing the rhetoric from them and he was used to being disgusted by it now it's worth remembering that you have parliamentary privilege over anything you say in the chamber so he does make a couple of comments in relation to uh, lawyers and solicitors it sounds like he may have gotten a legal letter or something of that nature from the rural independence about something he previously said because he's been having a bit of a tour on the the rural independence. I find it a bit rich coming from O'Riordan because my honest opinion of O'Riordan is that he is the most soulless, debased creature in Irish politics. I don't think he has any great belief in anything other than getting himself into power. And I can't even follow that on by saying he's competent when he has power. He is an incompetent who just wants to be there. But I also recognize, Michael, I could be wrong. Aidan O'Riordan presumably has family, peers, friends who think highly of him and uh, think he has many positive characteristics. I mean, I'm sure if, for instance, we ask Aidan's wife what she thought of him right now, we would receive a very positive answer. I'm listen. Many thousands of people in his constituency have come out and voted for him, uh, and on a number of occasions. And he, you know, obviously, the idea that somebody would go around and say we don't want, we don't want new people coming in here and living in this place and stopping houses being built so that new people would come in just to get votes, Gary, that would be horrible. I mean, Michael, it would be. I mean, it would be beneath us to equate those sort of things. In the same way, it would be beneath us to point out that there is a strong similarity to being very against immigration and being dedicated to basically turning your constituency into a fortress in which nothing new could be built for people to move into your area because that would ruin the nature and community that had developed. Well, it might ruin its Victorian character, Gary, and you wouldn't want that. I'll put a link to the uh, to the full debate. It's worth reading because no one was happy that this debate happened. I think there was a great deal of unhappiness towards the rural independence purely on the basis that they had brought this, that because they had brought it and there needed to be a vote, there needed to be a debate. And people were required to put forward their views on this. And I don't think they were terribly happy. I think there is a general feeling that they just don't want to deal with this. But they also don't want to have to tell people where they stand on it because it might be unpopular. They just want it to go away. Which is not generally how a democracy should function. It may be also, Gary, that they haven't... And Seriously, they may not quite have worked out themselves in their hearts and their souls, should they possess such a thing. What exactly they do believe themselves. I thought one, to me, the most interesting thing about a lot of the debate was obviously the invective was odd and unusual. And the, 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 you know, it's the kind of thing one would associate more with issues around, say, historical debates about the national question and things. But, like, for example, um, Holly Carnes, I think it said at one stage, something like that nobody has a veto on who, who comes to live in their community, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Hazel Chu said nobody needs to justify themselves being here now I'm not exactly sure about the context of that and for example if Hazel meant that you could be a person from a different ethnicity who is an Irish citizen that they don't have to justify being an Irish citizen well then she's absolutely right absolutely right I am very much I'm a Yusole man not a young Yusanguis man um, I voted against the 
and I'm, unlike I'm sure many of our listeners, I voted against the referendum to change the law I, the, regarding automatic citizenship being acquired by being born on the island. But if we're saying there's something, it just seems to be, there's a profound cultural difference here. David Quinn talks a lot about this, the word increasingly not being what left wing or right wing, but rather the somewheres and the nowheres, you know? That sense of people who can live anywhere in the world and they don't have any particular attachment, then the people who are somewheres are people who are from a place. And I, I, listeners may remember, Gary sent me, made me go to Madrid to a conference, which was a group of uh, think tanks across Europe. Gary didn't go. I had to go. And it basically was three days of conservatives and libertarians. And one of the, the big issue was about the, about the nature of, of, of immigration and a movement. The libertarians, obviously, the, the hardline libertarians very much open borders they, because they really don't believe in the existence of such a thing as we might call a state. And they say, you know, I, can, I should be able to go wherever I want. And, and that's a, that's, that's, I can understand that impulse. Certainly for the the, history, the narratives of those people who are saying that. But it's a very strange thing, isn't it, Gary, to say that no... Okay, the, leaving the, phrase, the phraseology, no veto on who gets to live in your community. That's a very... I think that's a really odd thing to say. That we... That as a community, as a... Which is, in a sense, an extension of our family as a, as a sovereign state. That's really what it means to be a sovereign state, isn't it? To decide we have things called borders and we delineate them and we allow people to come in, we allow people to leave. But th there are protocols, there are laws and we impose them and we, we make decisions. In fact, very clear rules about who gets to come and live in our community and who doesn't. It would be a very strange kind of a state that didn't have that. And if democracy ultimately is the manifestation of the will of the community of that state. Well, I, spo I suppose I have no idea what Shu was attempting to say. And frankly, I just don't really pay any attention to her because I, it's very rare she says something of interest or importance or even terribly you know, coherence. But... I think your, your point there about the interests, it depends what your view is of the role of the citizen and the role of government. If you believe the traditional view that citizens in effect own the country yeah. and it is the role of the government to govern in their interests, which you know, will have different interpretations depending on the mm. ideology of the party in power, but fundamentally it is it is for the people, by the people. Or do you view that the purpose of government is to better a people who are really just there by random chance. And citizenship has no great value other than as a effectively a, a legal artifact. You're going to have very different governments and very different views on what the rights of citizens are, depending on where you fall on that. Because if you take the former, citizens absolutely have the right to veto who comes into the country. And it doesn't matter if by vetoing someone's right to come into the country, that person's life is worse because they own the country and it is their right to decide that. But you see, Gary, yeah, you, you kind of, you put your finger on a problem there on the real, I, I think this is a, an intellectual ideological problem for, 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 for the Irish left, if we want to call it that. Even if by, by refusing these people entry, you make their lives worse. Not that long ago, there was a sense across a lot of the political classes in Europe that we had a kind of a moral obligation to increasingly to to lower the standards, shall we say, and that there was a report done recently which explicitly advocated for that of what we would regard as sufficient reason for someone to be allowed to enter into the country, right? Now that has changed since the the Merkel the open door that very brief moment of open door policies. I don't know if you saw Emmanuel Macron made a comment recently. He said, "We cannot we cannot take all of the world's misery." Now, 
I would like to think that most of the politicians on the left in Ireland would have the cop on to recognise the fundamental truth in that. But I don't know how many of them would be willing to accept, would be willing to state, to, to make it as, to make a statement to that effect as a principle. Because the principle then obviously carries with it the implication of a line that we can draw, a point at which we say, okay, this far, no further, this much, no more. We cannot take the whole of the world, the whole misery of the world upon us. We've seen changes in Denmark, we've seen changes in Sweden, we've seen changes in the language and the actions in Germany. We, we, there's been a change across Europe. And I think to some degree, there's a sense that the Irish political class has slightly been left behind. And I think they're a little bit a, a little bit at sea. They don't quite know which way to go on this. Because there's a record, I mean, listen, there was a statement made at I'm not sure. I think possibly it was Holly Carnes again in in the debate. She said that this there will be asylum seekers. I think she said asylum seekers, maybe refugees. There will be asylum seekers intense on the freezing on the streets of this winter, right? Well, you see, I don't know if that's the argument that she actually wants to make, because it seems to me if that is true, that that's an argument that we have as a state reached the limits of our infrastructure. We have reached the limits of our capacity to humanely accept people into this country. It's a horror if you are a genuine refugee coming into this country and you end up in a tent on the side of the street. That's a horrible thing. I, I don't know if it's quite the point you think she's making. There was a, a, a weird one, actually, when um, when Roderick O'Gorman stood up to speak. He was saying that the Royal Independence had put a lot of focus on male international protection applicants in, in, yeah. in the motion. And he said he wanted to make two points about it. And you know when you can kind of see what someone is trying to say, but then you see how they're trying to go about it, and you're like, that's not... That's just not not it, you know. Because you said the two points. The first was, could anyone here say they don't have a male uh, member of their family who's gone abroad seeking work? As in, you know, every family has someone, a man who's gone abroad seeking work. And then you said, well, that means there's unvetted male migrants in every one of our families. You know, visa systems are, are a vetting system. That's, yeah. that's entirely their purpose. So if you go abroad for work outside of the EU, then you are using a visa and you are being vetted. And even the EU regulations on internal migration have a number of regulations or a number of uh, potential responses if you move to a country and can't support yourself. So it just doesn't... And then his second point was that men are killed in war. And he started talking about the Bosnian War and how they're still finding men's bodies and would the deputies have stayed and fought. Sorry? What? The second point I will make is that men are killed in war. I am old enough to remember the pictures from the Bosnian War as the UN pulled out and the Serb paramilitaries arrived. In Srebrenica. It was all smiles at the start and then the men were separated from the women. They're still finding those men's bodies in pits today. They identify them with their dental records and the scraps of clothes still stuck to their skeleton. Men are targeted in war. Men are victims of war. And yes, sometimes men flee war. Maybe some deputies think they would not flee. Maybe some deputies think they would be braver. But if they're f if they're fleeing war, then they would have a different status to someone who was not fleeing war, surely. You mean in the way that, let's say, Ukrainian uh, applicants are not classed as, as standard international protection applicants? Yeah, like that. Like that. Or, that Al or, or Albania is not currently at war. Well, actually, is Albania currently at war? Oh, that's a kind of a how long is a piece of string question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, indeed. I get his, like, the point he's trying to make, the rhetorical point. It's just not very well made. But this is... The other thing, I mean, we've said before, it seems to me... And it, it may be the case that the nature of migration and just the nature of... Well, the war in Ukraine has exacerbated that or to, to that it would have created an, an issue around immigration but I, I i really do believe that if we hadn't had the disastrous series of policies 
uh, actions and inactions over the last, what now, oh, 10 years, more, 10 years, on housing to create the lack of housing, the cost of housing, the high, the high cost of rents, and the God, they Gary, they keep at it. I mean, every plan they come out with for rent, it just think no, no, it's just going to make it worse. There's another one going around now, and all it's going to do is it's going to drive the small renters out, and it's going to increase the the, the base rent starting point for new rents because old rents are going to be controlled. But if we didn't have that problem. I do think that we will be looking at a significantly less uh, explosive situation than we are, and I think that's true. That if you look historically, that where this when when it, when migration has become an issue, it's it's almost always connected with uh, a, a problem with infrastructural deficits in the country that they're going into. I think. It- just because you brought that up, I, I just wanted to, to comment on it because I've seen this response repeatedly, not not as you put it, but people saying that others are wrong to think that the issue is immigration because the issue is constraints on capacity and people need to be educated enough to know that the issue is not immigration. But you cannot de-link no. in immigration and capacity constraints. Levels of service demand obviously impact on the level of, of, of you know the usage of services so it's this sort of and it's this sort of mealy mouthed i don't want to talk about the issue as you think it is i want you talk about the issue as i think it is because that's the conversation i want to have and you're uneducated about it and i don't think that works anymore i think it just pisses people off yeah, and it makes, and I think it's what it's going to do. We've said this before. I think there's a real risk that what we're going to see in the in the in the upcoming, the the, the medium future is that because so much of the low hanging fruit of accommodation has been picked, that the only options other than the dreadful optics of tented villages or prefabs is going to be new build, and that's going to mean that you're going to be placing these these people in competition. And that's going to breed resentment. And that's not what you want to do. I, I remember near the start of the Ukrainian affair, when the government, there was a memo leaked from um, the cabinet on the things that needed to be done to ensure that immigration did not become an issue effectively. That resentment did not build up because if it did, there was a danger that it could drive certain political trends. Yes. So they were aware that this was an issue. and then, But when you look at this polling or when you look at what they've done, it kind of looks like if you had, if you had been in cabinet and went, I want to cause the rise of a more explicitly anti-immigration, in many cases, resentment-driven politics, I'm not sure what you would, do, would have done differently. And how incompetent do you need to be to create a situation where in trying to avoid something, you basically do exactly what you would have done if you were deliberately trying to cause it. And, you know, just to put the tin hat on it, and I think that what you've described is pretty well what has happened. What is their response? What is their big idea of how we're going to manage this? Their big idea is... Better regulation of social media, criminal charges to be brought against social media that aren't doing what we think they need to be doing, and better hate speech laws. That's that's their solution, Gary. That's the solution to the problem that people are feeling, that pretend, are beginning to feel resentment about around this issue. It it legitimately worries me that uh, not to be honest, a lot of the people, a lot of the backbenchers particularly, are aware that this is these are all terrible ideas. But there seems to be a legitimate belief that these will help, not just to cut down on those sort of views in society, but help politically. And you do feel this great urge to ask them this question. If someone you didn't trust started implementing things to control what you could say and control just what could be said around an area with possible criminal sanctions, what do you feel 
that you should trust them more or that you should trust them less? Here's one, right? This is reported by uh, your, 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 your friends in Grift. Uh, ahead of the Dáil confidence vote, Green Party junior minister said that attacking Justice Minister Helen McAtee is, quote, playing into a far-right trope. So attacking the minister is playing into a far-right trope. What we need is better regulation of social media using the laws we have now in place. Well, I think that's just delusional. Really delusional. We, it used to be a, 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 a kind of a running joke I had with a, 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 our, our blue shirt friend that there was a great tendency in Irish politics, particularly with our friends on the left and at times with, with Fine Gael, when they would lose an election, the first, their first response always was to blame the voter. I think there was an interesting thing that came up. It was a relatively minor thing, but I think it, it might it might be revealing, although it's it's also possible that it's Helen McEntee and so she just misspoke. She was asked, she went to an Oireachtas Joint Committee on Justice and Sharon Keoghan said, you know, Farai keeps coming up, it keeps coming up. It's obviously a political, you know, it's a political ideology. What is your definition of the far right? And this yeah. is important because even in the debate we had um, that the Royal Independence had, when Helen McEntee came up, she was talking about the far right. So, you know, what is it? And <laughs> Helen McEntee couldn't define it. And this is, you know, this is a woman who has been speaking about how the far right wants to spread fear and turn communities against each other. And they're spreading lies and then, when asked, says, it's, this is, this is what she said. The definition of the far right, I mean, it's, it's obviously a political ideology or a particular view that a person has. I'm not sure there's a definition. <laughs> and then, then what she said was, we have seen people to be anti-government, anti-state, anti-immigration, anti-women's rights, amongst other things. That would be my own particular view of those who claim to be far right. Now, that's not the far right, if people are interested in what the far right is usually, uh, how it is usually defined. There is disagreement about how it should be put. But in general, far right and far left is used to refer to parties who are on either right or left who are fundamentally undemocratic or are open to the use of violence to achieve yeah. their ends. That is how you go from right or left to far right or far left. Now, that is a matter of debate. Different academics take different views on it, but that would be how it is commonly used. You can be anti-government and anti-immigration and anti-women's right and anti-state and be on both the left and the right, depending on how you define anti-women's right, anti-immigration, anti-state and anti-government. That is a incredibly encompassing definition of the far right because none of the phrases used are defiant they could mean nearly anything well that is not kind of the point if it can mean anything then it is whatever you will you, you choose it to mean it seems to me that to say the bleeding obvious the, the minister and her friends regard the far right much like the supreme court justice regarded pornography i don't know what it is but i know it when i see it Actually, the way I the way I think they use it is, you know, you hear people talk about neoliberalism. Yeah, God. And it's like it's it's always this wide ranging reference about what neoliberalism has caused, but it's never quite clear what neoliberalism is, other than yes, much like the Supreme Court and pornography, you know it when you see it, and trust us because we're the people who know it when we see it. Well, in fact, I think Gary, if we wanted to synthesize this whole conversation, we could simply. Take that sentence and just make it shorter. Trust us. That's the that's the basic line. We're going to ha we're going to bring. In, have you noticed? And we'll finish. We should finish on this. But just on the point, the number of ads. I don't watch television, but even just watching YouTube, because I don't have Premier, I get ads, and listening to the radio. The number of ads on at the moment for government bodies. And from government regulators is absolutely astonishing. I don't know. Is it a way of just giving money to to uh, 
broadcasting platforms. You want to give you money, we'll just put some ads out, you know, give you a few quid. Maybe that it's as simple as that. But what they're saying is we're going to set up, we're going to regulate the newspapers, we're going to regulate social media. We're going to we're going to regulate we're probably going to end up regulating uh, uh, messaging services going on the basis of what's been happening in the UK with WhatsApp messaging groups these days. We're going to regulate all that. You don't worry about it. Because worrying about it, as we as the was it, who was it said to uh, Ben Scallon, you're obsessed with the hate speech bill. Oh yes, Martin. Yes, said that uh, Ben was obsessed with the hate speech bill. Yeah, because all we should do, Gary, is we should just trust them and just stop talking about this. It's just so annoying when you keep insisting and talking about these it. these people, Michael. You you put one piece of legislation that's potentially unconstitutional. And then you have to spend months answering questions about whether or not it's unconstitutional, as opposed to just letting them do it. And, you know, uh, someone presumably with the money to pay for that, or absolutely no money, and so can't be on the hook for it, will bring a Supreme Court case and we'll just figure that's, that is what the media is meant to do. Cover the process as opposed to saying, are you sure that's a good idea? And it kind of seems weird that you can't define, you know, like, hate in your hate woman. speech bill or a woman <laughs> all these complicated things anyway gary we have gone over the hour so i think that uh, we should release them in, back into the wild we shall be back next will we be back yes we well possibly we'll be back on sunday it's hard to know because next week we have to go away and do a thing but try and meet the pope try and meet the pope indeed and give him his our best wishes but on the basis that we can, we will be back next Sunday. If not, we'll be back sometime before Christmas. I wonder if they'll think that's a joke. They may well do. Yeah. But they yeah. won't be 100% sure. Yeah. Strange things have happened. All the best. <laughs>